Okay. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, this is Gwen Wilson. She is, what is your title? Health Science Librarian. Health Science Librarian at um, Washburn at the Navy Library. And she's giving our presentation today. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and start the presentation and then she can talk about herself and give you a little information. So hopefully if we can connect. Okay, chair. Look, there we are. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we can see. <laughs> they, <laughs> Everybody can see. They can see everything in that corner. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And this presentation is being recorded and will be put on the website, so um, if anybody misses it and wants to see it, it will be available. All right. So I can no longer see you guys <laughs> who's joining us, and I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. As Sarah mentioned, my name is Gwen Wilson. I'm the health science librarian here at Washburn University, and I completed my MLS degree at Emporia State. And I worked two years there at their nursing library before uh, coming here to Washburn. And I've been here at Washburn now for a year. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about some tips and tricks to when you organize your research so that you hopefully don't get lost or get surround, you know, consumed by the amount of research that you find. <laughs> okay? So, when researching, have you guys ever felt like this? where I'll bring it as it comes up where you are just you feel surrounded by the research and there's too much information and you're just having a hard time processing all the information that you're finding um, or even as drastic as this where <laughs> you are extremely overwhelmed and and as I like to think of it as extremely stressed as well to the point of wanting to have caffeine um, espresso IV into your um, system. So to prevent this feeling of being overwhelmed, the key is to be organized. So when researching for a paper or a presentation or a poster for when you guys do your presentation um, at a, a conference and you take a poster, you want to be um, organized with the research that you have found. So the key to that, I feel, is to be uh, organized with that. But there's ways to go about that. And not only will you be wanting to be organized to put that paper, presentation, or poster together, you want to be organized to know if you're still lacking information, right? So if you're in your research and you have found, you know, a dozen articles on your one point of your topic, it's good to know that you have that much research on that point and you know to f focus your research on the other points you want to cover in your um, research. So tips to being organized when research. The first one is, depending on the style, this is something that you decide as a researcher, you can just be organized on your computer or have it within your actual, if you do, like me, and I like physical paper research still, and you just want to keep it organized in a folder knowing what you have. So if you do to go with folders electronically, you want to label them. Have designated folders where it's just for that research is located in that folder. And then you would want to have within that folder, if you're to the point where you're still deciding if you want to use that article or not, then you have a folder that you can label potential resource, research and then move it out of that folder once you've read it. Uh, I don't know your research styles, that's not my concentration today, but when I research, I, I go through and I find any articles, websites that could work, correct? So, and at a later date, go back through and then, you know, decide did it work, did it not work, right? So you can use that as a way to organize those resources that you find. Another way 
is there are programs out there called research managers and they are another way that you can organize your research and through them you can upload full text of articles um, normally in a PDF format instead of an HTML but you would upload those and then through the manager you can sort the articles by author, by the publication that it was published in, or by date. And then it's really nice because you have the article saved through this program and then also through your folder as well. So I went through and I found some research managers that if you do decide to go this way, you can use. It's, and the first ones I'm going to list are ones that are free to you because, you know, you guys are college students um, and also professors. You don't want to pay for your resource, right? So the first one is called Mendeley. And you can see here on the slide that um, I have the title at the top and then I put the URL of all the, these research managers below the title. And I included a screenshot to give you a little idea of what they would look like. And you can see with Mendeley that you have your articles down the center. And when you click on an article and it's highlighted, you get a detailed information um, about that article on the side. And then you can sort by author, publication, year, as I mentioned. So also a nice thing about Mendeley and a couple other resource managers is you can create groups within them and invite other people to your groups. So if you're working with a professor on research or you're working with another um, student, you can create a, a private group and then upload articles that you found and share them all in one place through that and that everybody's on the same page of what research you found as a group. And so you can access that. Uh, you have a desktop icon, and then you can access it through their website and log in. Next one I have listed is called um, QIQQA. I pronounce it QUICA, but I'm not actually sure if that's the correct pronounci pronunciation of that. But it has a uh, similar setup to Mendeley. And that you, but one thing that I've noticed when I was looking at all the different kinds was you can look at them through an analysis here of if you have multiple authors on this chart that you see down at the bottom or you have a lot of articles from a certain year and you can look at that and kind of see are you getting a lot of old articles, getting a lot of newer articles and just kind of rate what research you have gotten that way. But they have the same setup with the list of articles down the center and then a detailed um, list down the side. The next one is called ReadCube. And this one, of all the others that I found, was a very much more of a basic research manager as a place to store the articles and then, you know, the full text of them and then go and get them again. But it didn't have as many of the features that Mendeley or um, Quicka that was mentioned already had. This is one that you guys might have heard about just as being a somebody who, you know, in the digital world that is called Evernote. And Evernote is a research manager that you can also just write your own notes. For if you're attending a conference and you don't want to actually write paper notes and you want to write notes on your iPad or keep notes on your phone or computer, you can save your notes into Evernote and then share them over multiple devices. So that's nice that you can access those notes and not have to be on that same computer. Uh, if you've been in the situation where you, you know, wrote up notes for a class on your personal laptop but you haven't saved that file to your email or to your USB and then you find you want to review them but you're not on your computer, if you use Evernote for notes, you can get access to it no matter what computer or device you're on. Also, though, the downside to Evernote as a research manager is it has so many features and it has such a variety of fe features that you could get lost uh, within them. So you want to be aware that uh, with all the features that you can stay not overwhelmed. Back to those pictures that were shown earlier. 
The last free one that I have is called Zotero, and it is um, more like ReadCube, where it is more of a basic program. And one thing that I really liked about this one on just researching about it was you can see over here it has this list of tags where you can tag a certain topic, articles that mention certain things, and then you can sort using these tags. Now, I do know that, that some of the others did have this feature, but this one was very clear on where it was and how you would use it. And so this is another way that not just searching by author, searching by publication, you can search by actually what the article talks about as you research. There are some additional research managers available, but the one thing about these is that they cost money. So with the subscription, I wanted to mention these because you might hear about them, but um, they do cost a, a fee, either a one-time fee or an actual subscription. The first one is called RefWorks. And to be honest, I, it never said that it was free anywhere, so I'm taking that it does cost money. And it mentioned that some institutions did um, have a subscription to this resource. So it does cost, but I have no idea on an individual level what that <coughs> uh, subscription would be. And it is a basic research manager that works off of the web. It's not, it's not a desktop manager on your computer. It works within the web browser. The other one is called EndNote. And this one you probably may have heard about already. I hear about this mostly from grad students who have been recommended to use it through their grad program. And this is one that does, uh, it is a fee to use it, but it has all the features that I discussed that other research managers have that are free and that I wanted to mention it because it's one that you might hear about um, talking to other uh, research people. Okay. So now that we've talked about the, what, so these ways that you can organize your research, there's a set, that's one step that people need to go through. But a second step to being successful as a researcher is to um, be able to use that information, correct? So the first step is find the research. Second step is to organize it. And the third step would be to actually present it in an ethical manner. manner whether it be a presentation, paper, or poster. So the way to present your research unethically is to plagiarize. So to review, what is plagiarism? Sure, most everybody is familiar with it, so I just have this here as a review, that plagiarism is the use of another person's words and ideas without giving that person proper credit. So. Knowing that, there are some cases where you don't have to give credit to people if the information is what we would call common knowledge. Okay? So this is the, when the situation that you would not cite where you got that information from or that idea. So therefore, you need to know how do you identify if something is common knowledge. One way is, is if the information is not cited in at least five references. So if you find a comment, an idea, in five sources that are credible, they need to be um, from a, not just off the internet, then you would know that that would be common knowledge. Another way is, 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 excuse me, is, it, is if that information is something that your readers will already know or something that the person can easily find in a general reference source. So some examples of common knowledge to really make it clear in your mind, it would be one, George Washington was the first president of the United <laughs> States. I think everybody can agree that that is common knowledge. The second one, something you guys can more relate to, would be iron, iron, I can't talk today, that on the periodic table, iron is number 26 and FE is the symbol for that. Okay. So you, that is common knowledge. However, if you have any doubts whatsoever, if, it, if that information is common knowledge, it is better to cite or to give credit to where you got that information. 
you'll never get catted off or be crit criticized for citing where you found that information. So if you are any doubt, um, cite. One way that most people, you know, end up plagiarizing when, you know, doing research is from poor note taking. So there are some ways that you can take notes. And two of the most common ways to take notes from research is to physically um, write the notes. To physically write the notes in a notebook or on a pad of paper. So you can kind of consider this, you know, the old school way. But I do think some people still use this method. <laughs> the second way is to write notes on the research. So you're writing, you've printed out an article, you're using, you know, being able to make electronic notes in a research manager. When physically writing notes, there are some, some tips that, or tricks to be able to make sure that you um, help prevent yourself from accidentally plagiarizing. The first one is when you are writing somebody's actual phrase words, using their words, to put a big Q, you know, in bold next to that quotation. Also, you can not even need a Q, put quotation marks around it, but within your notes. So there's no question that you didn't think of that idea and you're not paraphrasing it, you're actually writing down exactly what that person had said. The second one is, even if you do paraphrase it, you need to indicate that it comes from another source. So having an S or next to it will identify it as not your idea. And on the flip side of that, if it is your idea in your own thought, put down a capital M-E, and that will know that you know you didn't find that anywhere and you forgot where you got that information from. It did was your own thought. And then write with that, if you do write down that you had it, got it from another source, clearly mark uh, where that information came from. Which source did that information come from? Because that, if you don't write that down, marking that it's a source, you're going to have to take the time and refine what source that that information came from. So it's important to use both of those steps. So when you're writing on the research, you've done, you've either printed the article out or you're using the research manager, what one thing you can do is highlight the important sections that you want to paraphrase, that you want to take a direct quote from within that article, um, so on paper or in, in the reference managers, research managers, there are features depending on being able to look at the full text and highlighting on the computer and writing in notes that you can do within those. Also, if it's a book, you can either, if you're just using a chapter, I recommend making a copy of that chapter so that you can write in, because um, being a librarian, they do still frown upon, you know, writing in a library book. <laughs> um, but if it's, what, if it's just a certain part of that, you can copy out those pages and then highlight and make notes. So the second one is write your ideas, write you how you want to use that information in the margins so that you know if, it, if you do want to use this highlighted section as a quote, write quote that you're wanting to take that statement or paraphrase. So use the margins. So we talked about, you know, what, taking notes from your research. The next step would be when you're writing, correct? And you can't quote everything of what somebody originally said. So you're going to be paraphrasing information. And when you paraphrase, it's to be able to create a good paraphr paraphrase, you want to think of it as a two-step process. With the first step being that you must understand the information well enough to, in order to put it into your own words. If you don't understand it, you're going to subconsciously want to use the same words you know, the same phrases that that author did, used. So if you just can't get past that, it's better to quote it than to try to paraphrase it. So you need to understand it to the point where you are, you know, able to put it into your own words. The second step is that you have to correctly cite the source. 
So with an in-text citation as, or footnote, depending on um, how you're writing, and then an entry into the reference list. So it's not good enough just to put it into your own words. You still need to give credit to the person who had that original idea. So in addition to the two-step process, when thinking about paraphrasing, you can also think about um, a five-step process to go through when you are actually paraphrasing. The first step is to write off that first step of the two-step process. You have to read the passage until you thoroughly understand it, whether that be one time, two, three, a long time. And I recommend that you pick just the segment that you want to concentrate on. Don't read the whole document, the whole article, until you understand it. Read, you know, read about the study until you understand how they did the method of that study to be able to rephrase it into your own words. And so the next step is to put it aside, take that original article, turn it over, put it aside, don't look at it again, and then think about the points that you want to make that that article mentioned. And then you're going to write those points in your own words. So it's a pretty basic step. But what helps you to get it into your own words is by putting it aside and not looking at it. Because if you look at it, you're very tempted to just go, oh, I keep thinking about how he phrased it, right? So if you put it aside, it'll help you think on your own. Also, once you do that, compare it back to the original work, okay? Because if you read it enough, for a little while, the only way you can think to express it is in that original wording, correct? So after you do write a paraphrase, check. Bring back the original work and see, is it the same? And then the fifth step is you might need to repeat these steps because if you don't get it the first time, that's okay. To write a good paraphrase, it might take multiple tries. So um, go back, read it again, and then try the steps again. So I decided to include a paraphrase example because, you know, it's hard sometimes to think about, you know, what do you mean when you say that on writing a good paraphrase? So I have the original text from Joan Delaforto, and it's titled, What Johnny Shouldn't Read, A Textbook Censorship in America. So the original text reads like this. I'll just read through it. In the Dick and Jane readers, some of us remember from our childhoods, a family consisted of a married couple, two or three well-behaved children, and a dog and a cat. Father wore suits and went out to work. Mother wore aprons and baked cupcakes. Yes, I know that's nowhere close to what happens today. Little girls sat demurely watching little boys climb trees. Home meant a single family house in a middle class suburban neighborhood color the lawn green, color the people white, family life in the textbook work was idyllic, parents did not quarrel, children did not disobey, I know you followed that one, and babies did not throw up on the dog. I don't know where they got that one from. Um, so that's the original work. It's kind of fun. The first try at paraphrasing it states that according to De La Fateur, in 1992, the Dick and Jane readers of several years ago pictured an unrealistic family life. Stories always seemed to take place in middle-class suburban neighborhoods where life was idyllic, parents never quarreled, and children always obeyed. So you can see right away that although credit was given to the authors, the portions of this part were inadequate paraphrase because they use the exact same wording as the or original text, right? Because middle class suburban neighborhoods, that's exactly how the author originally stated that description, as well as using the term idyllic. And yes, they changed that parents never quarreled to parents didn't quarrel, and then also children always obeyed when it was children did not disobey. So you can see this, that it's similar, but it used very, very, very close uh, to the exact same phrasing. So another way that this could have been paraphrased 
is, in the past, elementary school reading books told stories of an unrealistic lifestyle. Families always lived in suburbia where homes and life were picture perfect. This is a good paraphrase. It, re it says exactly the same meaning, the same idea as the original text, but it's putting it into somebody's own words, correct? Right? But the downside of this is it's still plagiarism because it doesn't give credit to the original author. Okay? So the correct way to paraphrase this could be a, com a combination of the two first examples. According to Del Fattor, 1992, in the past, elementary school reading books told stories of an unrealistic lifestyle, blah, 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 blah. That's not how it is today. <laughs> but you can see through the example that it's now a true paraphrase with the same idea, but in your own words, giving credit to the original author. So some tricks to avoiding plagiarism in general is to give credit or cite whenever you use um, these scenarios. So cite when you use another person's idea, opinion, or theory says even a person's opinion, you need to give credit to them for that opinion. Give credit when any facts, statistics, graphs, drawings, any piece of information that doesn't fall under common knowledge. And we discussed, you know, how things are considered common knowledge. Quotations of another person's actual spoken words, or spoken or even written words. So if you're doing an interview, and so, and they're speaking to you, and you use a direct quote that they say, you would still give credit to that person. Also, anything written, which we think of as, you know, things that have been published. And then the last one is you paraphrase of another person's spoken or written words. So you give them credit, and then we talked about the different steps to go about creating a good paraphrase. So we talked about some tricks, but there are some common causes for plagiarism that are on the person to be aware of, that it's not necessarily, you're not plagiarizing on purpose. So some common causes are mixing your own text with a source text. So it's your own idea with somebody else's idea. And a way to avoid that is by, if you go through that five-step process of how to create a good paraphrase, you're looking away from the source while writing about it. Also, when you do you take your notes, identify when the idea is your own. And then identify when it is somebody else's. It's a way to avoid that. Sloppy note taking. You want to clearly mark, back to the first one, when it's someone else's ideas or words. And then you want to keep track of the citation information. On and That's easy to do if you just note down uh, on with the, either a reference manager, research manager, or you making print copies. Next one is last minute panic. And I have no control on this one. It's all on you as students and researchers. But you need to allow yourself plenty of time. If you allow yourself plenty of time to work, you can go through th these tricks, you can go through these steps that I've discussed and utilize them to do the best job that you have with your research. Also, incomplete citations. This is where, you know, using a, a reference manager or, you know, actually not putting down part of a citation in your notes and you're not printing off part of an article, you're printing off the entire thing so that when you go to do your in-text citations, when you go to writing the paper and doing your reference list, you don't have to search for the original source and know how to cite it. And then you would, you know, get frustrated or you just let that last minute panic and you just want to put something down. So if you have complete citations throughout, you don't have to worry about that. And then the last one is frustration because, you know, to not plagiarize, you need to cite. And I'll be honest, sometimes depending on the source, citing is not easy on just how to cite properly, how to, where to cite. And then if it's just a complicated publication, on what way you go about citing for it. So to avoid this, ask for help. Your professors, 
happy, I'm sure, to help you. And I'm so probably they're probably not thrilled that I'm, you know, telling you to, to go to them <laughs> as part of your resources. Um, but you can also go to librarians at your school and ask them, you know, for help when it comes to citing. And I know pretty much every college today also has writing centers and they can help you when it comes to citation. So by making sure that you do cite and that you, it's in your own words when you're using paraphrasing, you can avoid plagiarism that way. So you can see throughout that on bottom of my slides I included where I got this, my information from. Okay, this is my reference list and I really wanted to show this to you because I wanted to show that I did not come up with all these ideas myself and I'm giving credit to where I got that information. And then I will open it up for questions and discussion. So I don't know, do I go off of this? <laughs> I have a question, if I can do so. Okay. Uh, it is um, picking up on, on some of the things that you said, uh, that if someone, if someone talks to you, and it's a quote, uh, you should quote it. So uh, suppose someone just writes to you, but it's not been published. In the citation manuals, so in APA, there is a way to uh, how they want you to cite that. And okay. it's for unpublished works. Okay. I don't have it memorized. <laughs> but there is a way, and what you're is saying is that should be done. Yes. yes. You should still give credit, right. and what you just have to do is reference the, to do proper citation and, and, and proper way of, about how that for, is formatted, the manual becomes your, you know, right hand, and they, you do still cite it. In some chemistry journals, like they say uh, personal communi communication. Yes. Yes, and that's what they mean when they've, they've conversed with somebody and they're still giving them credit. I just wanted to bring it up to make sure people didn't yes. miss up on that, miss that one. Yeah. Yes, that's a great example. I had a question on, uh, as an author, is there a good uh, methodology you recommend? If I write something up and, you know, when you're coming and going from teaching, it's easy to forget and get a little sloppy as you described it between what's yours and what's theirs. Is mm -hmm. there something you'd recommend for kind of screening your own work before you send it out if you wanted to double check to make sure you didn't accidentally trip and put somebody else's material in as your own? There are. Um, I don't have a, any, a list or anything with, with me today, um, but there are sources out as a teacher that you can use to see if students plagiarize, and I would recommend one of those because that would be kind of the same thing on what you would be looking at and then uh, seeing if for your own work. So yeah. I would recommend what you would use as a professor to see if your students have plagiarized to, as, for yourself. Are any of those free? I believe, yes. I'm not, there I don't have a list. Free, but there but, may be some free work. Yes, they, there are some. I do, know, I do know there are some free ones for professors out there. Um, I don't have a, a list today. Okay. Be happy to provide that to you, though. <laughs> That'd be great. So, how how interchangeable are some of these sites? I mean, if you take notes on one, can you download them and then upload them to another site? Probably not. To be able to take, unless you input them from scratch. If you. Um, like if you used Evernote for your notes, what you'd probably have to do is create them again in another one. And, but, yeah, I don't think you can actually go from one to another. Now, article-wise, that would be just simply uploading the PDF again. Um, so that would be easy to do. So if you had, a, you know, your articles put into one research manager and you want to change to a different research manager, that would be um, relatively easy to do. Yes. Could you cut and paste comments? Oh, hold on. Oh, uh, you actually can't note and. Oh, hold yes. the yeah. no. You can go through Evernote and export uh, into PDFs. You just have to go to file. They've, they've updated their, their system. So now on any platform with Evernote, you can export quickly into a PDF file and then quickly into any other note taking source. 
in case you're ever okay. interested. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, I haven't played with Evernote very much, but that's good to know. So you can on Evernote export. And you can, too, on, you know, looking at full text on these reference research managers, look at them on multiple computers, okay? You don't have to be on the one that you have the desktop on to look at your full text within them, okay? So, and you can do that as well. Any other questions or discussion? Yeah, if you're not using Evernote, is there's, there, the, 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 the freeware doesn't block you from copying and pasting, does it? To so comments that you've made or however, or however you organize it, you could just copy, if you had to, just copy and paste it in another one, couldn't yes. you? Yes, yeah. yeah. It's, you just can't You just can't do it them. automatically. Right? Yeah, you, can, you just can't sync them. Yeah, right. Yes. Okay. But no, that is, that is accurate. All right, does anybody have any last questions? Okay. If not, then <laughs> let's thank Gwen for coming and presenting for us. And, uh, like I said, I'll, I'll uh, <laughs> like I said, I'll be putting the, um, we'll be getting this recording in a few days and then I'll edit it and put it on the website. So if anybody missed it or you want to show it to your friends, then um, or look at it again, then all that stuff will be there. So, and if you guys have any question, additional questions, just um, tell your coordinator, and they can send them to me, and I'll get them to Gwen. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.